So we're getting into Taylor series now. So I'm going to start here by the highlighter won't be very effective anymore. All right, so I'm going to start by looking at a power series again, and we're going to be centered at, I'm going to use the letter A for this instead of X naught. So we have our power series. So we have our summation, a n x minus a to the n power. And these are always going to be started at 0. You could start at a higher number past 0, but you don't want to use negatives. <clears throat> what happens if we started even just at negative 1? What would our first term look like? So we x minus a negative 1, 1 over x minus a. That would no longer be a polynomial. So that's why your powers need to be 0 or more, and you have a polynomial. If your powers are negative, you would no, no longer have a polynomial. So you could start at a number larger than zero, but you don't want to start at a negative number because then you won't have a polynomial and you'll have uh, weird things like uh, vertical asymptotes that we don't want to have. So we really want just polynomials here. It's actually not, it's an infinite degree polynomial. So it's technically a polynomial is a finite degree, but this would be an infinite degree polynomial so let's start out by taking a derivative. So f prime of x. All right, we take a derivative here. d over dx summation n equals 0 to infinity. So I'm going to commute the derivative and the sigma. What calculus rule did I use to switch the order here? Push it through a continuous function. There's a more specific name rather than, well, you can't push a derivative through a continuous function. What can you push through a continuous function? A limit. You can kind of push a derivative through, but you better be using the chain rule if you're going to be doing that. So if you push a derivative through your function through a differentiable function, you'd be doing the chain rule, which would look a little, it'd be like f prime of the derivative of the inside times the derivative of the inside. No, well, whatever the chain rule is, but you don't push derivatives through functions. What actually happened when I changed the order here? You're taking the sum of derivatives. It's the sum rule of derivatives. So it's the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. So in the notation, it looks like they commute, but what's really happening is this is a sum rule for derivatives. So next, I'm going to change the order again, and it will use a slightly different rule, slightly different calculus rule. What rule did I use on this next step? I changed the a n and the derivative. So a n is a constant coefficient, so this is a constant multiple rule. You can just bring the constant multiple in front of the derivative. So I think that was like one of the first two rules that we learned for derivatives, or at least the two most straightforward easy ones. Now we have the easiest derivative in the world. The derivative always modifies what's to the right. So all we have to do is take the derivative of x minus a to the n, and that is power rule. There's a little chain rule thrown in, but the chain part of the chain rule is just Derivative x minus a is just 1. So the chain rule is trivial here. So this is the easiest derivative. So it'll be n times x minus a to the n minus 1. Now, you want to be careful with your notation. You don't want to write a n n. The one ends a subscript, the other ends a uh, multiple. I'll just wrap the an in parentheses so it's pretty obvious those ends are not next to each other. What 
what happens when n equals zero? What's our initial zero term? It'll be zero. What term actually zeroes it out? The n. The n right here. So our, fir our zero term, our initial term, is going to be zero because that n multiple right there is going to be zero. Doesn't matter what x is. So that means we can actually start it at n equals one because that initial term will be zero. So that is the derivative of that power series that we started with. So that's f prime of x. <clears throat> I could take a second derivative pretty easily. All right, so take this second derivative right now. I'll give you 30 seconds. That should be plenty of time. It's going to work very similar to how we did it before. You can do those two multiple, the sum and the multiple rule at the same time, and it's an easy derivative. So I did all the steps at the exact same time. So wouldn't this turn into like an n factorial? Oh yes, we see the factorial forming right before our eyes. Absolutely. So that'd definitely be part of it. So that's one thing I wanted you to notice. That's very good. So it should be pretty easy, how, uh, obvious how to write the third derivative, or fourth derivative, or fifth derivative. So I can't highlight anymore with yellow, but Let's see. I'm just putting little purple boxes around the stuff that changes. So you just kind of notice that pattern. You get another n minus 2, n equals 3, etc. So let's get crazy and write the kth derivative now. Now, when you're writing derivatives in the power, you really need to use these parentheses. If I don't put derivatives, that would be f, the function of f raised to the k power. So you don't want to write it like that. This parenthesized exponent means the kth derivative. What value would n start at? k. So you can just see when the first derivative, n starts at 1. Second derivative, n starts at 2. Kth derivative, n starts at k. We have a n. Now this pattern's a little bit tricky. So I'll just write, I don't think the black marker is going to, or dark gray marker is going to be useful anymore. So we'll go, go light gray. So if we look at the second derivative above, there's basically two terms if I would write the third derivative, that would be three terms, fourth derivative, four terms. The kth derivative, that will be k terms. So counting that out. I'm going to do something that will make this pattern a little easier. Instead of writing just n, I'm going to write it as n minus 0. That's just n right there. And now it should be clear, what will the last one, n minus what value? I think it would be k minus 1. Because we want k of these total, and we're starting counting at 0. It's a little bit weird. You have to think of it as a computer scientist. You're starting counting at 0, so you get one more than it looks like you have. And we better be extra careful. It would be n minus k minus 1, like that. That looks annoying to write. <clears throat> Let's see if there's a better way to do that. So I'll just keep going with this right here. 
So n, n minus one. Now I'm gonna distribute that negative sign, so it's n minus k plus one. Which would be, I wrote it as a factorial. I'm just guessing and checking right here. We'll fix this in a second. Maybe it's better to leave that k minus one in the parentheses. So I have to cancel that part right there. So I think that's just actually n minus k factorial would cancel that. Mm -hmm. That looks good. So what I just wrote there is n minus k factorial, which would be canceled by the n minus k factorial on the bottom right there. So that's n factorial on the top, n minus k factorial on the bottom right there. I know negatives make our brain, at least makes my brain hurt. Fractions always do. All right, so that would be our coefficient right here. That would be the kth derivative of a power series right there. Okay. So you probably just want the formula. So this is getting a little bit complicated, even though you're hanging with me so far. Let's just write down, let's think about what happens when we actually plug A in. Why is the x value A really nice? If I plug in, so let's just start at the beginning where things are easy. Over here, we'll plug in x equals a. All right, my initial term will be a0 times a minus a to the 0 power. So a minus a to the 0 power is going to be 1. So we get a0. What's every other term going to be? They all have an x minus a in them. So they're all gonna be zeros. So that'll basically give me a zero if I plug in a. So when you did a minus a to the zero. Yeah, I erased it because I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so it's not L'Hopital's rule, which is probably what you thought of. Is that right? Because we have zero to the zero mm -hmm. power. So that's indeterminate. All right, if I write out f of x, we have a0 times x minus a to the 0 plus a1 x minus a to the 1. So on the next line, before I plug in a, it's basically the order we are doing things. So this is f of x, and then I plug in a. Uh, so that's why we don't have a L'Hopital's uh, indeterminate issue. But yes, that is something you should be concerned about. I don't want to talk about it, which is why I erased it and pretended like it wasn't going to happen. But in this case, it was the order we were doing things, basically. All right, so now it's pretty obvious f of a, all the first degree, second degree, third degrees are going to be zero, so we just get a naught right there. So that's f of x. No, that's f of a. Now I'm going to take the derivative. We already wrote all that stuff down. When I take the derivative, a naught's going to disappear because it's constant. We're going to have a1 times 
one, x minus a derivative will be one, plus a two times two times x minus a to the first power. That comes from the term I did was too lazy to write down. That's the a two x minus a squared. That's where that term comes from. And now we go f prime of a, we just have a1, oh, there's more terms I didn't write. Now, all the other terms are going to get zeroed out here. So we're just left with a1. Now I'm going f double prime of x. So I'm looking back at f prime of x, not f prime of a, because I want to take derivative before I plug in a, or everything's going to be zero. So take your derivative, a1 is going to disappear, and we're going to get 2a2 plus I would get, let's see, 3x minus a squared, Ooh, x minus a to the I better write a couple more terms up here. We get a three x minus a cubed. So f prime. I was trying to get away with being a little lazier, but I think we write, need to write down a little bit more detail. So I'm just adding that third term into f prime. So we have three times two a three x minus a to the first power now. Plus dot dot dot. Now plugging in a, we're going to get 2a2 two plus all the higher order terms are zero. So just 2a2. Two two. Alright, last derivative we're going to take here. Third derivative, we're going to take that off the second derivative, which is two lines up. So our constant term is zero, and we're going to get two times three a three plus all the higher order terms. So the only term that survives is that term right there plus the higher terms. So we get two times three a three, and when I pl uh, when I plug in a, all the other dot 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 terms turn into zeros. So f triple prime of a. Now I'm going to write it as 3 factorial a3. You can see the factorial forming off the higher degree powers right there. All right, once you see these, I'll put some boxes around them. There's a lot up there. Oh, this is really like reading a blackboard, old school. Prime. Now, if I want to continue this notation, yes, instead of instead of that pi that purple one, sure thing. All right, I can't use the fancy ones because my computer runs super slow. But let's go the bright green though. All right, let's try that. How's that look? Good. All right. While we're doing colors, I don't think the I never like the red pencil anyways. Let's get that out. Oh, I already had the green right there. Excellent. So, wait, that indigo. There's that's not going to be very good. All right. So, let's get that out. All right. Orange? Sure. Aren't you glad I changed? Highlighter is probably not going to work no matter what. Maybe if I do a super light highlighter. Yeah. That's not going to work at all. So highlighters are gone. Alright, so we're going to use that green. What else? How about light blue? Baby blue. 
It's just a bit thin. Thin? All right. Yeah. Oh, perfect. So we got gray, orange. That should be enough colors, I think. All right. So I'm highlighting the derivatives after we plug in the A. Now this first one doesn't have a derivative above it. There's really no symbol for a zero derivative unless I use a parenthesized zero like that. So I want to keep these in the same notation. So that's a first derivative. A second derivative, I'll use parentheses two. Not that one. That one, I'll use parentheses two. And this one is parentheses three. So at this point, the pattern should be super obvious, except one of them has a factorial and none of the others do. Yeah, let's just throw a factorial on. What's two factorial? Two. two. What's one factorial? One. one. Now, zero factorial is a little strange. It's defined to be one, basically so things like this work. So that's why zero factorial is defined to be one. All right, so now we can write fk derivative plugging in A. So write down what that is. It should be painfully obvious. So we get k factorial AK. That is FK evaluated at A. All right, that is all we need to write out the Taylor series formula right there. The k derivative plugging in A is k factorial times AK. So if I solve for AK, AK is F K derivative evaluated at A divided by K factorial. All I did was solve for AK. So that is going to be super useful. Put that in a box. So that's what we're going to be using. <coughs> so I think in my handwritten notes, I have the letters they use in the book. So I'm just going to rewrite it. They use C instead of A and N instead of K. So I'm just going to write that down here. So our Taylor series of X is summation C, <coughs> C N X minus A the n equals zero to infinity, where cn is the nth derivative. So f with the parenthesis n in the exponent evaluated at a divided by n factorial. So that's one of the first things to go on your cheat sheet right there. So that a in the parentheses is different than the a out front. Yeah, before I used a, a n instead of c n, and I was using k's to index, but I just looked down at my note. I was just talking instead of reading my notes. And I wasn't using the same letters that they're using in their book. So this should match your book exactly. But that's the exact computation that we just did to get that a k right there. I'm just showing you exactly where it came from, basically. So just keep taking derivatives of your power series, carefully keep track of everything and see the pattern, and that's, that's where that CN comes from. All right, so let's go ahead and find a Taylor series for a function. Now I'm choosing these functions, or they've already been chosen, so the derivatives are reasonable. I don't want to do square root of tangent of x or something like that. I think you can imagine square root tangent of x would get miserable really quick because you have like some product, or some chain rules that would be horrible. So there's plenty of horrible ones that I can do that would have any type of chain rule would be bad. So we're gonna find the Taylor series of, we'll just do the uh, one over x, f of x equals one over x which is x to the negative first.
we're still using that centered at language, what would be the worst x value to center this at? Zero. Why would zero be really bad? I don't even know, I can't plug in even for the zero term, the zero derivative plugged in at zero is undefined. So you can't center this at zero. It's your, all your functions already undefined. So I could either use positive or negative numbers. Let's keep it positive. One's a little boring, I'm gonna go with two. So two is a little further away from zero. So we'll center at x equals two. So the procedure for doing this, <coughs> the formula is written right on the board. The first thing we're gonna have to do, I'll write this out. So first thing we're gonna find the fn of x pattern Plug in x equals a, so that's fn of a. Why can't I just plug in f of a and then take derivatives? Why did I have to find the nth derivative at x first? What would I get if I plugged in a and then started taking derivatives? I get a bunch of zeros. So that's not what we want. So you have to find the derivative for x and then plug in a. So you gotta get your, do I calculus first, then you're plugging in a, and then you just use the formula right there. So that's what we're gonna do. Take derivatives until you see a pattern. Now, depending on the function, you may have to take more derivatives. Some functions will be super easy and obvious. You don't need to take many derivatives at all. So this one shouldn't be too bad. So f prime is negative x to the negative one. I'm going to actually write out negative one as a coefficient there, because we're gonna be collecting coefficients. Uh, f Yes. If we want to be correct, that'd be negative two. It's pretty important. So we're taking the second derivative, so it's I'm leaving in negative one and just concatenating on or putting in the next product x to the negative three. So about the third derivative is where it becomes reasonable to just write parentheses three for your derivative notation, I would say. You can start it right away if you want. Um, will most Taylor series turn out to be like a factorial type thing? Factorials will show up quite a bit. Uh, not always, uh, if this is an exponential function there would not be that um, sine or cosine would not have that pattern. But as you're about to see, once we get the numerator here, we're gonna be dividing by n factorial. So this factorial is actually gonna get canceled. Mm -hmm. Whereas things like exponential or sine and cosine, they'll have a factorial in their denominator that will survive. So it, all, it really depends on the function. So it, some do, some don't. All right, do you see the pattern? So now we have to write f n of x. So I do see a factorial. It's an n factorial, same number of terms as our derivatives. So third derivative had three factorial, second derivative two factorial, so nth derivative n factorial. What else is happening? They're negative. So are, is every term negative? So two wrongs make a right. Every so every other term is negative. So the even terms are positive, the odd terms are negative. How do we get the sign to go positive, negative, positive, negative? Negative one to the n. So we'll try that. Sometimes you need negative one to the n plus one, but I like to write down my guess and then check, does this work? So it looks like our first derivative should be negative. 
second derivative is positive, third derivative negative. So it looks like our pattern is going the right way. It goes like this. I don't have to offset. If it was the opposite, I'd do a plus one or a minus one to shift it, shift our negative over. But this one was already just fine. And now just the power of x. What is our power of x? How does it relate to n? n minus one. Ooh, negatives are hard. So that's not quite correct. So I'll go negative parentheses n minus 1. Or you could do negative n minus 1 would be another way to write it. So whatever you prefer, doesn't it's the same. You could also divide it by n, x to the n plus 1. That would be the same, the same thing. All right, so we are ready. Actually, I will divide it by, by that term to make our power positive. So any questions on getting this pattern down right here? So the next thing we're gonna do is plug in two. So this is all step one in that procedure. Step two, plug in x equals two for our x's. This is probably the easiest step. However, it's also because it's so easy, sometimes you may forget and skip right over it. So make sure that you do not do that. So it doesn't affect the ends. They're not at all x, so the only thing it changes is x becomes 2. And I think we're ready for step 3, which is use the formula. So our n factorials in this problem cancel out. So negative 1 to the n over to the n plus 1. All right, so that is our cn term. And then we're just going to so we're going to plug into that Taylor series formula. of x function was 1 over x.
So if you started with, if your original function was a polynomial, eventually your derivatives would all be zero. So what that means is the power series, the Taylor series for it would be finite degree because eventually all your terms would get zeroed out. And actually it would reduce down to, it would reduce down to the original polynomial. So it's a way to recenter your polynomial around a different, usually polynomials are written with just powers of x or powers of x minus, you could think of it as x minus zero. So polynomials are naturally centered at zero. You could use this to recenter them around a different a value mm -hmm. if you wanted to. You could also do that using algebra if you're, it's kind of tricky, but you can recenter it with algebra if you want. It's kind of annoying. It's much easier if it's centered at, let's say, x minus two to expand it out fully and combine terms and it would be centered at zero. But doing the other way around is a bit more complicated. I haven't really done it, but I'm, I'm sure it could be done algebraically. You'd be factoring out something that's not there. Long division, uh, I don't know, something like that. There's probably a procedure for it. But you could use this procedure would be one way to do it. <coughs> so let's talk about uh, radius or, or interval of convergence. I can say for sure that the interval is no wider than two wide. Let's, what x value are we centered at? Two. 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 You can see that right here without looking up. There's no way that one over x equals anything that this summation would represent at zero. How do I know? It's undefined. So how would I get undefined on one side equals a number or something that would be defined on the right side. So it's no way it's going to be that big. It turns out it will actually stop exactly at zero and it will be open at zero, which means it will also go to the other direction. So it'll go to four. However, it may or may not be open at four. We'd have to do more work to decide if it was open at four. I think this particular one looks like four would not work because I think the if we plug in four, we would get four minus two, which is two. Basically, these two terms would cancel out if x is four, and we would have plus one minus one plus one minus one added up, which will never turn into a single number. So the only other vocabulary word you have in this chapter is Maclaurin series. Learn series is a Taylor series centered at zero. So that's the McLaurin series. So you're centered at zero, you have McLaurin series. Um, and the rest is basically just practice. You can take derivatives of power series. So for example, if you found the power series, the Taylor series for sine, the derivative of that series would be the series for cosine because derivative of sine is cosine. So you can use one Taylor series you know if you know this function is a derivative of the other function, take derivative or antiderivative. And we took a derivative at the beginning of class. You could just as easily take an antiderivative. Works really similar. Just do the anti-power rule. 